part two for chapter 10 lecture, <clears throat> we left off talking about the hydrogen bonding that is the strongest intermolecular force that we're going to talk about in this class. And those types of forces are, so the hydrogen force is found in those molecules that contain fluorine, nitrogen, and oxygen directly bonded to at least one hydrogen. If they don't have that, so if oxygen is bonded to two carbons, for example, then it cannot form a hydrogen bond even if it is an oxygen which is an, uh, an element with higher electronegativity. So that the bond between an oxygen and hydrogen or fluorine and a hydrogen and a um, nitrogen and hydrogen has to be there. Okay, now moving on, we're going to look at a few bulk characteristics, meaning we're looking at certain character characteristics of liquids in the bulk, not necessarily individual molecules. And now what happens in the, in the molecular scale affects the bulk scale, those characteristics, but we're looking at them now in the bulk. Viscosity is the first one. Viscosity is defined as how easy or how hard it is for a liquid to flow. So the resistance of a liquid to flow is called viscosity. We know just from experience that some liquids flow a lot easier than others. Water flows a lot easier than honey, for example, especially honey when it's cold in the winter time. You probably have heard the saying, you you're move slower than molasses in January because certain liquids, obviously with temperature, we're going to talk about that, but certain liquids have uh, larger viscosity than others, so they resist flowing more than other liquids, like water, for example. Honey, therefore, has a higher viscosity than water. It has a higher resistance to flow. It flows, so it's harder for it to flow than water. There are three factors that influence viscosity. One, big surprise here, the intermolecular forces is the first one. The second one is temperature and then the shape of the molecules. Let's talk about intermolecular forces. Well, what have we said? We know that the higher the intermolecular force is, the, the, the liquid is going to resist more to flow because it it has really high intermolecular forces. So those molecules interact a lot with each other. If you think about how molecules flow, as, they, as you pour something, those molecules have to flow past each other. If the intermolecular forces, if their interaction is low, then it's easier for them to flow. But if their interaction is high, then it is harder for those molecules to slide past each other. The other, um, so for example, so in our example of honey and water, honey then will have a higher intermolecular force than water will, and we'll see why in the next slide. And therefore, it flows slower than water. It's got a higher resistance to flow, a higher viscosity. Temperature makes a dif difference, and we'll stick with the, the example of honey because we all have seen this in our, in our everyday life. We see that honey in the wintertime gets thicker, and it is much harder for it to pour it out of the bottle than it is in the summertime. That's because of temperature. Think about the relationship between intermolecular forces and temperature. What did we say at the very first slide? We said that temperature, which translates to kinetic energy, varies inversely with intermolecular forces. So if you increase the temperature, then the intermolecular forces or the interaction between the, molecule, the molecules decreases because they're moving faster. So they, they can slide past each other easier because the temperature is higher, they have more energy, they're moving faster. If you 
this is just as a side note, if you want to make honey uh, less viscous, so if you want it to run faster, obviously increases temperature. And you can do that, the easiest way to do that is put the container of honey in a pot of water that is set to a low setting so you don't burn the, con the bottom of the container if it's in a plastic container. So put it in a, in a low, low heat and the water increasing in temperature is going to increase the temperature of the honey, therefore lowering its viscosity, making it easier in the winter time to pour the honey out. Now shape also has an important, uh, I guess it's an important factor when we talk about viscosity because remember what we said about the shape of the molecule. The larger the molecule, the more stretched out, the more surface area, the higher the intellect, inter, intermolecular force, force will be, the higher the viscosity. Think about if you're pouring out little beads or um, yeah little little small beads they flow a lot faster than if you had let's say a bowl of pasta or you know a pot of pasta boiling and you're pouring it out that flows um, they they flow a lot harder than a little beads because you have these long strands of pasta that you're trying to make flow and that's harder to do than the little beads. I mean, that's kind of a gross simplification, but it's just a picture in your head to see how shape does influence the way liquids will flow. So the shape of the molecule, the larger the molecule, the, the larger the intermolecular forces because they interact uh, due to the larger surface area. So the resistance to flow increases with increasing molecular, intermolecular forces and therefore viscosity is higher. Let's look at water versus honey one more time. Here's water pouring out. Here's honey pouring out. We, but we all know that honey is more viscous. Why is that? Well, we said the most important part is the intermolecular forces. And uh, therefore, uh, I mean, we, because honey is more viscous, that, that means that the intermolecular forces in the honey are higher. How is that? Well, if we look at what they're both made of, here's water, here's a molecule of water, and here's what honey is made of. It's made of two sugars, fructose and glucose. Okay, well, what are the predominant intermolecular forces for both of these? Well, I can see water has an oxygen bonded to two hydrogens, so I can form a hydrogen bond with this OH and another hydrogen bond with this OH. So I have hydrogen bonding. In, in fact, I have two places where oxygen or water molecules can hydrogen bond. So that's the water. Now let's look at the honey. Well, let's see, first of all, the molecule of fructose. I have an OH here, so this oxygen is bonded directly to a hydrogen. So I can hydrogen bond here. I can hydrogen bond here. I can hydrogen bond here. I can hydrogen bond here and here. So I have one, two, three, four, five different places where fructose can hydrogen bond. It's the same thing with glucose. One, two, three, four, five different places. And look at the shape. These are much larger molecules than these. So even, so all of the intermolecular forces, London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole interactions, hydrogen bonding for, fru for fructose and glucose are much higher because the molecules are larger than the water molecules. You can see then why honey ha is more viscous because its molecules, fructose and glucose, interact a lot more than the water molecules interact with each other. Intermolecular forces are higher for these two molecules than just water. Higher intermolecular, intermolecular forces, meaning higher viscosity, higher resistance to flow. And that's viscosity. Now, let's look at adhesive versus cohesive forces. It, it's, I find that it's harder for students to remember to, these two types of forces. I mean, they're, they're intermolecular forces, but... There, one is within the, the, the same type of molecule, this is with different types of molecules. 
and if you can tell the difference then you can just kind of form a picture in your head of what it should be so adhesive well let's start with cohesive cohesive forces are intermolecular forces between the same type of molecules. So if I have, all of us have seen, if you just wax a car surface and it rains, you see it that the water from the rain really beads up on the surface of the car. And that shows me the cohesive forces between the water molecules those forces are stronger than the forces between the water and the waxy surface of the of the car that's why the water molecule beads up in a, as a bead instead of more of an arc adhesive forces are forces between different types of molecules in this case in this example between the water and the wax molecules that those would be called adhesive forces. These are two types of molecules, two different types of molecules, and they're adhesive forces, cohesive within the same type. Talk about or think about how we use cohesive in everyday life. If, if we use it's a cohesive group, that means that it's a tight group, meaning my water molecules are so within the group, the, those forces are strong. This is we observe this very easily with a meniscus of water and of this is mercury okay they have two different shapes why is that here for example the shape of the of the water meniscus is concave so it curves upward whereas the one the the meniscus for mercury curves downward it's convex well, this is an example of the adhesive and cohesive forces in action. Here for the water, the, the water molecules interact not only with the water, other water molecules in the liquid, which are cohesive forces, but they also interact with the sides of the, the glass tube, which are the adhesive forces between the water molecules and the glass molecules. Now the glass molecules have uh, different, several different places where water can interact with hydrogen bonding. So that's why the, the adhesive forces, so the forces between the water and the glass container are, are stronger than the cohesive forces between the molecules. So these molecules on the surface are going to start interacting even more with the glass with the glass molecules and so it curves up a little bit. Now here mercury molecules, the cohesive forces between the mercury mole molecules are much stronger than the adhesive forces between mercury molecules and the glass molecules. So they shrink, if you will, the the mercury molecules they shrink back from the glass because the forces between the mercury molecules are much stronger and they don't interact much with the glass therefore they curve downward because they're trying to interact with each other instead of with the glass and they get this um, con convex type of shape here's kind of a cartoon to help you remember it okay here's my water molecules and here's the sides of that container, okay? So if, as you see, polar or charged object, which the glass would be, if it's a nonpolar, like the, the wax car, then this interaction will be a lot larger. But here's my water molecules. The interaction between water molecules is called cohesion. The interaction between water and the sides of the container or a different type of molecule is called a adhesion. So those are two different types of molecules are adhesion. The same molecule, those intermolecular forces are called cohesion. Here's another example. This is uh, on wax. It looks a little, it, you're missing the wax here, but here's the beads of water on a wax surface. We know that that happens because we've seen it. Well, what's going on here? the interaction, the cohesive forces between the water molecules 
are much, much stronger than the adhesive forces between water and the wax surface, and so the water sticks together. It forms a bead. This is true because water is a polar molecule, whereas the wax is a nonpolar molecule made of a lot of carbon and hydrogen. And therefore, we all know the expression like dissolves like. Oil and water do not mix. And that is why water forms a bead. If you have, if you mix oil and water, you'll see that separation. And even if you shake it well, you'll see the little, wa the little drops of water as emulsion in, or I'm sorry, little drops of oil, or it depends on which one you have the, the least, I guess, but um, drops that form because these molecules, these two types of molecules, don't like each other. One is polar and one is nonpolar. And if you have that kind of interaction, the cohesive forces are much stronger than adhesive forces. Whether we're talking about wax molecules or, or water molecules, the cohesive, their respective cohesive forces are much stronger than the adhesive forces between water and wax. Here's water on glass. You can see that it forms this arc and not a bead because water molecules like to interact with glass molecules. Glass is polar, it's a polar object, and it has a lot of, of um, places where water can interact and form hydrogen bonding, so it likes the, the adhesive forces between water molecules and glass molecules is stronger than the cohesive forces between water molecules. So you'll see the water spread out instead of a bead like you do on wax or nonpolar type of compounds. This is the adhesive and cohesive forces and the difference between the two. Learn the definitions of these very well and then try to follow what is going on in molecularly, what is the interaction when you have, especially when you have a polar and nonpolar interaction, those adhesive forces are not there because they don't like each other. If this were wax, water would not be holding on to it, it would just hug its other water molecule much tighter and therefore they would form a bead. But if you have a polar object, then they like polar because water is polar. So they also interact with the sides of the container. Okay, the next um, characteristic of liquid that we're going to talk about is vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is um, the pressure above the liquid that is reached during an equilibrium. So we have an equilibrium between the liquid and its gas phase and those molecules of the gas that are above the liquid are exerting a, a particular pressure because they're hitting the sides of a container and therefore that is called the vapor pressure of the liquid. So here's a picture of how that happens. If we put a particular liquid in a container that is hooked up to a meter where we can observe the pressure with a closed end, okay? Then after a while we know that some molecules of the liquid are going to escape the liquid phase and go into the gaseous phase. Even though we didn't have any molecules at first, any molecules of, the, of that particular type in the gaseous phase, they were all in the liquid phase, that's how they started out, they will establish an equilibrium. So some of them will go, some of these liquid molecules, or the molecules in the liquid phase, are going to end up in the gaseous phase. And this keeps going until you, re you reach a certain equilibrium, where the same amount uh, or the same number of molecules they, that leave the liquid phase from, so go from liquid to gas, enter from gas to liquid, and so it's a dynamic equilibrium. If two molecules uh, in the, from the, leave the liquid phase to become gaseous molecules, two others leave the gaseous phase and go into the liquid. So you have no net change, but you have what is called a dynamic equilibrium, so it keeps, it keeps going. It appears not to change, but it is 
changing because you don't have the same molecules on the in the liquid phase and the gaseous phase all the time. You just have a constant number of them. Okay, this raises then the pressure that the, the gas is exerting. So we went from zero to, I don't know, this isn't really numbered, but to the maximum amount. And then we'll see that this, this uh, column here moves a little bit. And so we can then look at the difference in height between these two ends of that column. And that gives us a value for the vapor pressure. The vapor pressure depends on two factors. It depends on the intermolecular forces and it depends on the temperature of the system. If I have strong intermolecular forces in the liquid, you will have low equilibrium vapor pressure. The vapor pressure is inversely related to the IMF. Remember this because it will you will get it confused with the boiling point, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. Intermolecular forces, the stronger the intermolecular force, the lower the vapor pressure of the gas above the liquid. The opposite is true. The, weak, the weaker the intermolecular force, the higher the vapor pressure. Why is that? Let's just look at it. Let's look at what's happening to the molecules. If I have a strong, strong intermolecular forces in the liquid phase, that means that not very many molecules are going to leave that liquid to enter the gaseous phase. I have to enter a lot of energy. They, are, they have to have a lot more energy to overcome those interactions because they're stronger than molecules in a liquid phase that has weak inter intermolecular forces. If I have we weaker intermolecular forces, it doesn't take as much energy for those molecules to leave the liquid phase and go into the, the gaseous phase. Therefore, because you have more molecules in the gaseous phase, you have a, a higher vapor pressure in a liquid that has a weak intermolecular forces. So remember that vapor pressure is inversely related to intermolecular forces. The higher the intermolecular force, the lower the vapor pressure. The high, or the lower the intermolecular force, the higher the vapor pressure. Let's look at how vapor pressure changes with temperature. Or, okay, so here's a model of low temperature and high temperature. At low temperature, most of my molecules are going to be in the liquid phase, as you can see, very few of them are going to have enough kinetic energy. Here's number of molecules, kinetic energy. Very few molecules are going to have kinetic en enough kinetic energy to escape. If this is the minimum kinetic energy that the molecules need to go from the liquid to the gas, very few, look at the fraction, very few of them Will, will have enough kinetic energy to escape into the gaseous phase compared to all these other molecules. Look at how many there are in the liquid phase at lower, lower temperature. Now what happens if I shift to higher and higher temperatures? Well, as you can see with a black curve, which is a higher temperature, I get a larger number of molecules escaping because they have they reach that minimum kinetic energy that is needed to escape from the liquid to the gaseous phase. And if I continue to raise the temperature, you would see that you'd get this type of curve where you get a lot more and then a lot more, etc., etc. So the higher the kinetic energy, meaning the higher the temperature, the higher the vapor pressure. Remember that the vapor pressure is, di is directly related to the number of gaseous or molecules in the gaseous phase. So the more molecules can escape to get into the, the gaseous phase, the higher the vapor pressure. And the higher the temperature, the higher the kinetic energy, the faster those molecules are moving, 
and therefore they can escape easier into the gaseous phase. So vapor pressure and temperature are directly related. The higher the temperature, the higher the vapor pressure, whereas it was the opposite with intermolecular forces. Please remember these and learn these relationships. Be very careful when you think about the vapor pressure and boiling point because a lot of students get confused by the two. Okay, now let's look at an example of a, pro a type of problem with vapor pressure. So if I have the structural formulas for four different compounds, list them in order of lowest to highest relative vapor pressure. Okay, lowest to highest vapor pressure. The lowest vapor pressure is going to have the highest intermolecular force. We're assuming that the temperature is the same for all of these, so the temperature is not a major factor. Therefore, the other factor that influences the vapor pressure is the intermolecular forces. So how does vapor pressure change with intermolecular forces? The lowest vapor pressure has the highest intermolecular force. The highest vapor pressure has the lowest intermolecular force. So let me look at these different types of molecules and figure out which one has the highest intermolecular force and the lowest intermolecular force. Well, first of all, let's look at diethyl ether. This oxygen over here is bonded to four different carbons. And even though oxygen has a little bit of I mean, related to it, there's a little bit of polarity because the chain starts to increase over here. Um, this is a big molecule. That little polarity difference that, or the electronegativity difference between oxygen and carbon is so small um, that this is going to be pretty much a non, non-polar molecule or very, very low, small polarity. As you notice, this oxygen does not is not directly bonded to a hydrogen and so I cannot form hydrogen bonding in an oxygen that's directly bonded to two carbons. So this will have the lowest or the weakest intermolecular force. It will probably have just London dispersion forces. Because it has the lowest intermolecular force, it will have the highest relative vapor pressure because the molecules in the diethyl ether liquid do not interact very strong strongly with each other so it's not so hard to remove the molecule of dieth diethyl ether from the liquid phase and put it into the gaseous phase because those interactions aren't very strong. Now let's look at the next problem. Okay well we've got ethanol, we've got water, and we've got ethylene glycol. Okay, so there's diethyl ether. Wait, there's diethyl ether um, that is the, the lowest uh, actually I listed them in order of intermolecular forces. So diethyl ether has the lowest intermolecular force. So it will have the highest vapor pressure. Now let's look at the next one. Here I have ethanol and I have water and I have ethylene glycol. If you see all three of these molecules form hydrogen bonding. I have an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, hydrogen directly here. Here I have two oxygens bonded directly to hydrogens and here I have one oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. So I have here I have ethanol, we can, which forms hydrogen bonding, and water, except this can only form one hydrogen bond. This can form two hydrogen bonds. So this will have the next highest um, intermolecular force or the next lowest um, vapor pressure. So ethanol will, will be next in intermolecular forces. And then I have water and ethylene glycol. Water has 
two places where it can hydrogen bond, and so does ethylene glycol. However, so in that regard, they have the same type of intermolecular forces, and they can bond at exactly the same spot. I mean, and they have double hydrogen bonding places. However, this is a larger molecule than water, so all of its forces are going to be larger. So the dipole-dipole interaction will be larger, the London, um, London dispersion forces will be larger. So ethylene glycol will have the strongest intermolecular forces between these two molecules. So water is next, and then ethylene glycol is the one that has the highest intermolecular forces. So I, the way I've listed them here is from lowest to highest intermolecular forces. And I forgot to add this, I'm sorry, but the lowest to highest relative vapor pressure, which means that because I've listed them from lowest to highest intermolecular forces, I, needed, I need to list them in the opposite direction from lowest to highest vapor pressure. So ethylene glycol will have the lowest vapor pressure, water will have next, ethanol will be next, and then diethyl ether will have the highest vapor pressure. So we're going from ethylene glycol, lowest vapor pressure to highest vapor pressure, diethyl ether. And this is the case be because ethylene glycol has the highest intermolecular forces. Those forces are so strong that it's very hard to take ethylene glycol molecules from the liquid phase and put them into the gaseous phase. Vapor pressure is the pressure that is exerted from the gaseous molecules on the sides of the container. The fewer the molecules are up there, the smaller the pressure will be, the vapor pressure, and therefore ethylene glycol will have the lowest vapor pressure, whereas diethyl ether will have the highest. Okay, let's look at the boiling point now. The boiling point is the temperature at which its equilibrium vapor pressure is now equal to the pressure that is exerted on the liquid by the surrounding. So this is basically when the, the vapor pressure becomes equal to the pressure, the atmospheric pressure around the liquid. And it's different for every liquid. <clears throat> now, remember the atmospheric pressures or the pressure exerted by the gaseous surroundings is not going to be any different. I mean, it will be different depending on whether you live in Colorado or whether you live in Michigan. But because I'm, if I'm taking the boiling points of compounds in the same altitude, that pressure, the outside pressure, what we call atmospheric pressure, does not change. And therefore, um, what is going to change is the vapor pressure. So for those liquids that have high vapor pressures, they're going to reach a boiling point much sooner than those that have low vapor pressures. Remember, the pressure is the, f the force that is exerted by those molecules in the, in the gaseous phase. And... If I have few molecules in the gaseous phase, they aren't going to exert much vapor pressure. So the higher the vapor pressure, the lower the boiling point. They are the opposite. They are re re inversely related to each other. Higher boiling point, lower vapor pressure, higher intermolecular forces. This is the relationship. Boiling point directly related to intermolecular forces. Higher, the higher the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point, the lower the vapor pressure. The opposite is true. The lower the intermolecular force, the lower the boiling point, the higher the vapor pressure. Here, here are those four molecules that we just talked about in the previous slide. Ethyl ether, diethyl ether, Ethyl alcohol or ethanol is the same one. Water is over here and ethylene glycol. You can see the difference in uh, boiling points between these four molecules. 
the ethyl ether has the highest vapor pressure and therefore it has the lowest boiling point. And then we move on. We said alcohol, the ethanol had the um, next highest or lowest um, intermolecular forces and therefore it had the next lowest vapor pressure and therefore it, it has um, the next lowest boiling point. <clears throat> With water, um, here's the, the boiling point of water right here. So here's ethyl ether, here's ethyl, the, the ethanol, and here's the water. Water, we said, was the third one um, in intermolecular forces, so it had the third highest, meaning it will have the third highest boiling point and the third lowest vapor pressure. And then ethylene glycol is the last one. Look at how it, it's not even, it has a much, much higher boiling point than water is. It's off the curve for us here um, because it has very strong intermolecular forces and therefore it has very low vapor pressure. I have an, a link on the on the, the uh, jet net that I've posted that talks about the relationship between boiling point and vapor pressure. So take a look at that as well, just to help you understand the relationship because it can get a little bit confusing. I always start, so when I look at boiling points and, and uh, vapor pressure, I always go back to the intermolecular forces because if you know how they're related to the intermolecular forces, you will not mix the two up. If I'm thinking, so the higher the intermolecular forces, which it's ethylene glycol here, the lowest the vapor pressure is going to be, the highest the boiling point. And the opposite is true. Ethyl ether, diethyl ether had the, the, the weakest intermolecular force, which means it has the highest vapor pressure, which means it has the lowest boiling point. That's the relationship between intermolecular force, vapor pressure, and boiling point. Okay, and then the last part that we're going to talk about are phase changes and phase change type problems. Um, we're going to do mainly the, the heating and cooling curve for water, but any liquid will follow similar curves. Okay, so here's, here's a typical... Um, phase change curve for water. I have temperature over here on the y-axis and then I have this curve so it starts out in the red, blue and follow it up over here. Now let's follow the curve um, and then talk about each different area of the curve and then in the next the next part I have a problem but I'm going to make a separate video for that and I'm going to post that separately how to solve problems with these types of phase changes okay so if I look over here the lowest part of this I see that there's a curve um, there's a, a, a line and I reach so this red part, it's red until it reaches zero degrees Celsius. And you can see that it's increasing. The temperature, obviously, it's increasing till it reaches zero degrees. Then once it reaches zero degrees, I get this little plateau, this flat line over here. What, what it's telling me is that the temperature is not changing anymore. So here's, here's uh, zero degrees right here. What is happening over here is that the solid begins to melt. So if I have ice, okay, I take ice, this is uh, H2O, so water in a solid form, meaning it's in ice, it's ice. If it's lower than zero degrees Celsius, let's say it's at minus 15 degrees. If I have uh, ice at minus 15 degrees, I cannot melt it until it reaches zero degrees. But the temperature can increase from zero to, or from minus 15 to zero. And if I have a temperature change, you can see over here, um, I have this line until it reaches that zero degree mark. Once it reaches the zero degrees, 
all the, the solid will start to melt because that's the melting point of water. At the beginning, so to the left of this straight line, horizontal line here, to the left of it is the beginning point of where ice starts to melt. And then as I add more energy, that the added energy that I'm adding is going to melt the ice. It's not increasing the temperature, it's just melting the solid. So it's taking, it's putting into, and it's putting energy into the system, so it's breaking up those water molecules from the solid. Um, we talked about how the molecules in a solid are very well ordered, and they're very close to each other. That energy that I'm dumping here is taking those molecules and separating them, pulling them apart, so that they can become liquid. Therefore, I have no temperature change because that's where that's what the energy is going. At the opposite end, so on the right-hand side of this horizontal line at zero degrees, all of the ice has now melted. So here I have ice, I have solid at zero degrees. In the middle of this, I have some solid and some liquid. And then at the end of this, I only have, so all of my solid is melted, I have water, but the water, notice that it's still at zero degrees. It just has melted. Here I have ice at zero degrees. Once all of it is melted, I have water, liquid, at zero degrees. Now if I increase the temperature some more, it's, it's going to, you can see that I do have a, uh, um, a change in temperature. Okay, the temperature increases if I dump energy into, into it, into it, it's increasing, it's increasing, the molecules are starting to move faster, etc., etc., until I hit 100 degrees Celsius. That is the boiling point of, of water. <clears throat> As I'm increasing the temperature, I'm also increasing the vapor pressure of water. Because remember, the vapor pressure is the amount of, of um, pressure that is exerted from the, the molecules in the gaseous phase. And we said that is directly related to temperature. So if I increase the temperature, I'm increasing the vapor pressure of water until that vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure, the pressure around the 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 water boy basically getting to uh, being heated up and once that those two pressures equal each other I hit my boiling point which is a hundred degrees notice that here I have liquid on the left of this straight uh, horizontal line I have liquid at a hundred degrees Celsius as I keep increasing so adding energy I add more energy I add more energy what's happening on this horizontal line Notice that it's not changing. The temperature is not changing. That's what the horizontal part means. The, the e extra energy that's being added, it is used to take those liquid molecules and uh, pull them apart into the gaseous phase. So I'm evaporating the liquid. And somewhere in between this line, between these two ends, I have a mixture of a gas and a liquid water. Once I get to the end of that straight line, all of my liquid has evaporated. So I have gas, water vapor, at 100 degrees Celsius. It's still at 100 degrees because the temperature hasn't changed. But it's now to the right of that, of that horizontal line, meaning I have now evaporated all of my liquid and I made it into a gas. Now, any, any energy that I dump into the system will go to increase the temperature of the gaseous um, molecules of water. And so I have five distinct phases in this curve. I have here the first part, I'm heating a solid to get it to the melting point. Once it reaches the melting point, the temperature doesn't change. All of that energy is going to pull the solid apart to, to make liquid. When I reach, when all of the solid is melted, then I have, I have liquid at still at zero degrees, but it's all liquid here at this point. 
And then if I dump energy into the system, I'm increasing the temperature of the liquid until, and I do that until I hit 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point for water. At this point, I have liquid at 100 degrees. Once I boil all the liquid, this is my horizontal straight line that's telling me this is where evaporation is occurring. At this point, on, when it's all done, I have all liquid at 100 degrees. If I add more energy and I raise the temperature, I'm raising the temperature of water vapor in a gaseous state alone. Now, the opposite is true. I mean, obviously, I can start over here, and if I take energy off, so if I'm cooling, I, if I cool the gas, it will, the, its temperature is going to drop till it, heat, it, it hits 100 degrees Celsius. And then if I keep cooling it, it, all of that gas is going to go through this straight line here. It's, it's um, condensing to liquid at 100 degrees. If I keep cooling it, it's going, its temperature is going to go down till it reaches zero degrees Celsius. And then if I, obviously if I keep cooling, that liquid is going to freeze. So this is the melting and the freezing point. It's going to freeze until it hits, all of it is frozen and it's a solid at zero degrees. And then I'm going to, um, if I cool it even more, I'm going to get solid at lower temperatures than freezing. So minus 15, minus 30, whatever. So in one direction, so if I'm increasing going from lower temperature to higher temperature, I have melting over here and evaporating. And if I'm going in the opposite direction, I have, here I have condensation occurring, and here I have um, freezing. I froze for a moment, pun intended. Okay, so these are uh, the heating and cooling curves, and we will deal mostly for the water. And but a lot, most liquids they will follow the, a similar curve, except that their uh, freezing or melting point and the evaporation condensation points will be different. Uh, than the water. They have different boiling points and melting points, but the curves should be similar to these. Notice how different the energy is between the melting and the evaporating. Notice how much more energy we need to put into the system to evaporate versus to melt. And this makes sense, right? Because to evaporate something, we have to take those molecules and spread them so far apart. They have to have so much energy, so much kinetic energy, that it takes a lot of, so look, look at how much energy it takes to do that, versus if, if I'm just melting it, I have to put some energy to separate the, the part, the molecules from the solid phase, phase, but it's not, I don't have to put as, as much energy as I do to take them completely apart in the gaseous phase. Okay, and here's a problem that we will look at that deals with the heating and cooling curves. And I, as I said, I'm going to be doing this in a separate video because I will walk you through every step. I might do several of them. And then uh, I will post a link to YouTube and you can watch those on your own. If you, will, if you have any questions at all, we will have those two blue button sessions, and um, you can always email me as well just to make sure that you are understanding the concepts correctly. All right, this concludes the lecture for Chapter 10. Thank you.